Hello, good afternoon. So good to see you here also in our new venue, but also greetings to our guests who are watching us online. Uh, my name is Jarmila. I'm here on behalf of Vihlava International Documentary Film Festival. I'm head of industry office. But actually, I wouldn't be here <laughs> uh, unless uh, my colleague, uh, our friend Daniela Staniková, the director of Creative Euro Media Desk, was possible to be here with us. Unfortunately, some uh, accident occurred and uh, she asked me to talk on behalf of her. Uh, I would like to explain why we are organizing this presentation. It's because the Creative uh, Europe Media has announced a new call for co-development and we were thinking how to bring attention to this uh, new scheme. And uh, we thought that we would find out if there is any uh, co-development uh, cooperation already in place. And we addressed our emerging producers and we found out that there are many. <laughs> and we would like to uh, show one of the successful ones, which already was... Uh, taking place even before this scheme. For this uh, call, uh, you can apply um, in case that there are at least two co-producers co from uh, media countries. And it's not only for cinema projects, but also for TV or projects or for projects for digital uh, platforms. So I should stop talking and I would like to introduce to you the moderator of this uh, presentation. Uh, it's a another emerging producer from like a participant from last year Marek Novak who is a representative of the Czech Republic uh, thank you very much Ermila thank you for introducing this uh, this discussion about uh, co-developing a successful documentary I'm glad that uh, I'm here on this stage with uh, my colleague from emerging producers 2021. Iva Plemic Tiviak from Horopter Film Productions based in Serbia and Jasmina Sjercic from Bokalupo Films, France-based production company. Uh, Iva is a producer and Jasmina is a co-producer of Merry Christmas Yivu, the documentary by, about, uh, by Mladen Kovacevic, which we are going to talk about. And uh, first of all, I would actually like to apologize for my voice, which I started to lose after last night. And uh, already, if I make, uh, and also if I make any uh, factual mistakes or names mistakes in uh, when we speak about this very complex and uh, very rich uh, co-production structure and the whole story of its development, because it's a very simple uh, Serbian, uh, Swedish, French, German, Belgian, Qatari co-production, which reminds me that I already forgot to introduce our <laughs> our uh, third guest. Uh, Mario Adamson from uh, Sisyphos Film Production Sweden. Hi Mario, nice to see you, although just online, but uh, good to have Hello, you guys. here. Hello guys, hi. Okay, uh, great. So uh, we, can, we can start. We have quite a long um, manual for this discussion. As I said, it's actually quite a, a long and uh, interesting story. And we have one hour, so we will try to cover the most uh, important uh, formative point of this. So Merry Christmas Yivu is a, is a fifth documentary, I think fourth feature length documentary of uh, Mladen Kovacevic. It takes place in the city of Yivu in China, which uh, houses around 600 factories manufacturing most of the Christmas decorations for the rest of the world. And the story follows uh, uh, certain characters from these, uh, from these factories uh, in their everyday life and how they are servicing this huge global market of Christmas. So uh, I would ask you, uh, Eva, a simple question, how this all started? You worked, uh, you know Mladen uh, from before, you are the Serbian uh, producer, and Mladen is the Serbian director of, of this film. So where did the idea happen and how did you take it off? Yes, I know Mladen from um, Belgrade, from uh, working in the same community, documentary community, but Merry Christmas Evil was the first project that we worked on together. Then we continued from 2017, we continued and, uh, and now we are working on three more. Um, uh, so Merry Christmas Evil started uh, as, a, as an interest of the, the director, Mladen Kovacevic, who uh, was very interested in um, contemporary China in general, and was looking for basically a, a, a cinematic story 
to follow. So uh, this is where um, Yi Wu uh, caught his attention. Uh, we um, quite fast we decided to um, to start um, developing it internationally because we were sure that this film has to be done in that way. It was production wise pretty ambitious. Um, so the first um, basically stop was um, was your doc when it comes to development. Even before that. Uh, we uh, started asking around uh, how we could, you know, travel to China, how we could shoot in China. And we were quite lucky because um, uh, Paul Powell of, of EDN was the one who connected us to uh, his friend Steven Sandberg, who, um, who basically explained how things are and what we need to do. Uh, and in the beginning, it really felt like Mission Impossible, like something that would be very painful, you know, uh, uh, bureaucratic and and unattainable. In the end, uh, thanks to the fact that we are coming from Serbia, um, we um, we surpassed all these um, impossibilities of traveling and working and shooting in China, and um, we we basically um, found found a service company first in Beijing. Um, that helped us do the first um, research shoot. And we also did the first part of the shooting with them, which was a bit challenging because they were, I mean, Yivu is near Shanghai, so the whole crew needed to be flown uh, um, over there. And uh, we were basically learning from, from you know, uh, everyday experiences. So the, the second part of the, of the shoot was done with a, with a company from Shanghai. Um, I wouldn't go into details about... <laughs> yeah, I, uh, actually, the, the, we are already in China and with service companies, but you mentioned Eurodoc, which, uh, as I understood, was uh, where you met with Yasmina and also with uh, Mario or Ruth, the uh, colleague producer from Mario's now Mario's company, Sisyphos, which is also already getting a bit <laughs> complicated. But so I would make I would ask a simple question. You applied for Eurodoc with Mladen, with this project, what stage it was? Have you already shot something by then? Have you had any money in place? And what changed after Eurodoc? Eurodoc takes place in three weeks. First is uh, about the creative development. Second is about financial element of the project. And third is pitching across one year. So what was at the beginning? And maybe then you can cover. And uh, Yasmina and Mario, please also uh, step in with your inception in this uh, inception point in this project. Yes, uh, our Eurodoc experience was the um, most important um, step in the development of this project because we applied for it. Uh, I was supposed to go with the project because it's a, it's a training program for uh, producers, but I found out I was pregnant. I couldn't travel, so uh, the director, Mladen Kovacevic, went there. This is where we um, met all our co-producers who uh, are all uh, Eurodoc alumni as well as emerging producer <laughs> alumni. Um, so basically we met Yasmina and we also met uh, Ruth Reed, who um, uh, introduced us to her um, Swedish partner from Sisyphus Film, which was Mario Adamson. And from then on, uh, so from 2017, we, st we literally started co-producing, but actually co-developing this, this film. And it took um, a whole year of um, going to different um, development uh, programs. Uh, but I would still say that uh, Eurodoc, um, at the end of Eurodoc, since they are, uh, uh, in, they, they are uh, offering this pretty luxurious um, way of presenting your project in the last session to, um, to very uh, interesting decision makers, but in a way which is um, you know, uh, laid back and without uh, without a fuss and with a lot of time to explain. We knew quite early that this project um, uh, is attractive to people, how they react, and th this basically sparked uh, the, the further interest. But from then on, we started co-developing together, which means that all of all of the people involved Ruth, M Mario, and, uh, and Yasmina were very involved. So uh, when we continued uh, going to, I uh, know, um, 
um, Carlo Vivari, Docu Talents, um, Doc Leipzig, Doc Preview Training, um, uh, Neon. Uh, we uh, we did it together. <laughs> they, oh, oh, there was always one of us with Mladen until um, until until Trieste uh, when uh, uh, East meets West, where we were um, all together. By then, by then uh, we already had two more co-producers. One is Heino Deckert from Mayade, um, who was also a tutor at, at Eurodoc, and uh, Thierry Detail from A Visible Film from, from, from Belgium. That also uh, was connected to the fact that uh, uh, two televisions, so uh, NDR, Arte, and uh, RTBF were interested in co-producing, but they had this um, obligation to have a local co-producer. So, um, uh, to finish with the co-production uh, uh, structure, uh, it was uh, everybody who I already mentioned, plus um, uh, Doha Film Institute that came in the end as post-production money because Serbia is eligible for this. That's a very uh, nice uh, European slash uh, Middle Eastern uh, documentary octopus or family or mafia. <laughs> uh, but uh, I would uh, ask Yas Yasmina for you when, uh, what was the moment? Uh, it sounds pretty straightforward how Ivanao put it, like, yes, yeah. this company, this TV, <laughs> like it's, it sounds that uh, there was, there had to be something which really sparked the interest of everybody. It sounds like it was immediate. So maybe Yasmina, can you tell what was it for you? Uh, for me, well, I, I was participating with another project that I, I have been developing at the time uh, at Eurodoc, so, and that's where I met Mladen um, and Ruth. Um, and actually, I also have to mention, I mean, it's not that that sparked, but uh, it also kind of appro approached us even more, because with Eva, we, we worked on another project of a short film uh, that we worked on together of another Serbian director. Um, Miloš Tomic, and so we knew each other, so I knew that Eva was involved as producer in, in the project, which also makes quite a, a comfortable uh, land to, to land to. <laughs> and uh, um, I come also from, I come from Bosnia originally, and uh, so we share the same language, and with Mladen it was very easy to connect, because the, the program gathered uh, French-speaking uh, participants that coming from different places and English-speaking participants coming from different places. Madian was one of Serbian participants in an English-speaking group and I was a French participant in a French-speaking group. So somehow we, okay, we, we met in Novi Sad, so it was, uh, it was the moment that and I, I heard about the project through uh, the presentation and um, I was keen to, to, to learn more, and at the, si at the same time, it was kind of uh, an attraction that was very intuitive. It was not like some, cal I mean, it was not some cal calculation of, um, I wanted to get part uh, of, of the team also, and to start to build something together with them. And actually, this is what happened, because we really did start from the very beginning to follow the project uh, on every, in every aspect, creative and financial and, imaginative like strategies and what could be one or another and we actually we did quite few others that didn't work out and uh, so it was a continuous uh, work throughout uh, until the premiere uh, well even beyond but um, it was a very pleasant um, collaborative um, collective uh, work <laughs> in a way even though the the most uh, uh, common question that we would get is like so how did you survive you know the six lateral co-production that must be held and I can imagine how it, it can be held, but this was actually very, very, very pleasant. It was, it just, we kind of clicked somehow, and, uh, and I, I would like to point that out. Okay, thank you. I would now ask Mario how pleasant it actually was, <laughs> because um, if we, if we, like uh, Serbia was the country where the project got uh, production funding from the Film Center Serbia, and then it was the regional fund in Ile de France, in, in France. But, but Mario, uh, you brought the Swedish Film Institute support for both development and production. Uh, so I imagine that especially the development funding must have been crucial for obviously the development of the project. So can you now mention uh, how that uh, materialized and how uh, pleasant was it, as Eva said? 
Yeah, first of all, I just want to thank you for having me uh, talking with you guys. Uh, and uh, I mean, to go back, I think the moment when um, Ruth, who was participating in the Eurodoc, presented a, a number of projects that she really thought was, oh, this could be something, uh, because we just had finished this uh, film called Skinbirds. So she thought that, yeah, maybe this project could be interesting, but um, I really fell for the visuals uh, that I saw from what Mlad and, and Eva had done. And I told her, this is the kind of cinema I or films I want to work with. So we, uh, it's also very a non-brain decision to decide to be part of this. So after a couple of meetings, we kind of decided that uh, we should try to uh, make this work in the best way. And um, I mean, since the funding schemes in Europe are very different, and I think uh, what they talked about is maybe it sounds like a complicated thing to be uh, six produce, co-producers, etc. I think as soon as you have a common trust, and you will, I mean, I think all this has to be built on trust. Without that, I don't think it would be possible. And that as soon as we decided, okay, we're in it to make a, the film and not think so much about, okay, who's the main producer, who's the second producer, who's the third, et cetera. So it's more that we collective tried different kind of ways on how to raise as much money in a way that made it possible to make this film happen. So, so, I mean, that's our starting point. And you guys correct me if I'm wrong um, or if I say something stupid. Uh, but uh, yeah, that was the start, I guess. And uh, we got development. I mean, also the thing that um, the current commissioner at the Swedish Film Institute, she was a former DOP. So she and Laden, when they met for the first time, they really clicked because they could talk about lenses and focus and stuff so at that meeting i felt like yeah this is gonna work out so yeah that was the start and then we just continued and of course it was a, a little bit because it was just my second film i was involved documentary i was involved in so it was also really trying to see where the boundaries are and how it works. And uh, I'm really happy that at least from the Swedish Film Institute, they really support these international collaborations and they understand that a film is not one country's thing, it's something we do collective. And that's what I think is important and should be supported much more in all countries. And just, I mean, of course, I understand the fact that we need to develop local directors and film crews etc but i think at core we want to make great films sorry yeah no that's very very nice uh, that there is this this that the institute is so progressive and open to a serbian director coming with a project taking place entirely in china yeah actually that's yeah that's what i wanted to point out because from my point of view coming from france where it's a quite procedure 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 to to receive funding is quite lengthy and uh, there's a lot of uh, writing and, and rewriting and uh, the for for me I must confess the, the, the rapidity and efficacy of a Swedish Film Institute and the, the way how they just said yes and they actually enabled us to de-block the, the, the project and actually to maybe think okay the project is possible in a way because the money that was in Serbia in place it was a starting very important thing, but then suddenly this kind of gave another layer on it, and um, it was quite amazing. Like for everybody was jealous. <laughs> um, I would like to add here, uh, and it's important for the whole uh, development um, path of this a film that uh, what coincided with, with it was the fact that uh, the Serbian Film Center. Um, uh, during these years, um, uh, started so from 2017 on, started this very uh, uh, this resolute and 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 organized effort to uh, uh, put a lot of light to uh, Serbian documentary filmmakers, uh, 
So during these two years, for example, while we were um, developing and shooting partially Merry Christmas Eve, we were um, enabled to um, to take part as participants in in all all different all these different uh, industry uh, project industry trainings projects pitching forums. Um, Serbia was present as a as a delegation of uh, Serbian filmmakers, and that made all the difference because we were really you know it, it was a lux luxurious. Um, a position to be able to uh, to communicate our project to so many different people and in so many different stages. Uh, so we are a living proof that this kind of effort uh, makes sense and uh, should be continued. Um, but maybe here we could show uh, this first video, which is actually the Merry Christmas Eve fundraising teaser which um, Mario was talking about and which we used in the beginning to to basically um, dazzle people with our visuals. Let's do that. Please. <laughs> <笑>是吧 So the clip which you used for fundraising and during, I don't know if all those platforms, but from what I counted, it was six development platforms or, or markets where you presented the project. And from if you look at the end credits or opening credits of the film, there is a bunch of broadcasters and supporters. So it obviously uh, or most probably was fruitful to do this. But uh, and you already mentioned that there was a there was a spotlight uh, incentive from from Serbia to to showcase the the projects. 
but uh, did it uh, actually um, push you further in also the creative aspect? And if we speak about uh, co-development, uh, how was it then to collaborate on the creative side? And how was it for Mladen to speak to not one producer, but to more? And how did the uh, creative vision evolve over, over this rich uh, development process? Well, it was clear at some point that we would have to make um, versioning, that we would have to make a short version because um, Arte got interested in um, at Eurodoc and then we were going th towards a d deal with them and they uh, this was their um, uh, condition, one TV hour. Uh, so that was one aspect of, you know, having to kind of uh, comply to, to what we are... Um, to, what we are offered and what we would like to do. When it comes to the, the festival version, the integral version, um, it was somehow, somehow to, to the point clear from the beginning that this would be the approach, that it's going to be um, an observational, um, fixed, um, long takes with, 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 with distance but closeness at the same time. Uh, in the editing in the editing room, we we kind of uh, at at some point after the initial being thrilled about the uh, the approach working, which is something we found out after the first um, test shoot. But uh, we we basically editor um, Yelena Maximovic and and uh, the director they um, they realized in which way they want to go, which characters should be. Um, um, you know, visited and and for how long? Um, we had a different kind of possible piece in which uh, less characters would be in the film, but uh, their stories would be told in more detail. So basically, uh, creative-wise, everything was happening in the editing room, and literally none of it was happening in the in the offices of uh, of broadcasters or you know or in our uh, offices. Um, <laughs> so um, we were happy that um, apart from broadcasting co-producers and the Arte and uh, RTBF, we also had, and I want to mention them because they supported us from the beginning and throughout the production, which was terribly important for us. So that there was um, Current Time TV, there was two Swiss uh, channels, RTS and uh, RSE. Um, uh, and there was uh, Wiley. So basically, we uh, managed to finance production with pre-sales, which in result uh, uh, had a, a kind of a repercussion in the, in the distribution because uh, this money was already in place. Um, but um, uh, I don't know, I, I would like to mention maybe... or. <laughs> or you Can wanted you just to go back something? to something a bit like what you were saying about these workshops, if, if it was useful? Actually, I, I was not thinking about that before, but I just realized that actually, um, so it was a complex, uh, complex, not complex, but it was just a multiple mm, co-production scheme. And actually, uh, all these places also um, made us possible to meet in person. And I just realized that now that because we are so used to doing these like zooms and whatever, that actually during these few years of production, actually we have seen each other a lot, which also makes difference because we really spend time together. And on these pitching sessions, when you're supposed to present something as a team, I think it makes difference then afterwards also how you work with people because we have been like discussing something a little bit before and then presenting it and then everybody goes back to your office. But I think that this also made us maybe um, be in this kind of uh, conf uh, confidential comfort zone or between us director as well because he was with all of us a few times, not only like once because we signed some contract or we got some funding. So I think it was actually important. Maybe I don't know exactly if it had an impact exact that another TV channel came on board. This also, but I think for sure in terms of team building in a way, because it was like a team that was like a great, uh, great opportunity because otherwise I don't think we would be able to meet 
because I, I really saw Mladen a lot, which is great. He lives in Serbia, I live in Paris. I saw Eva a lot, I saw, I saw Mario a lot, so no, I thought it was good. No, it's definitely good and important to remind this that it's such a, such a simple thing that the essence of all this is actually for people to meet and talk and to be able to figure out what, I, what they want to do together. And I think especially now uh, with COVID experience, it's very obvious. But at the same time, the maybe uh, another layer of this is the co-production and the funding of it is a lot of the sources were soft money. So it sounds like a dream for a documentary to be financed from, from pre-sales, but especially for uh, Southeast European uh, budget levels to co-produce with France and Sweden. Uh, I imagine that can make the, uh, the whole budget, I mean, to make the project more expensive and uh, if I understood well, um, Sweden did uh, sound, post-production and music, and uh, France did the image uh, post-production. So Mario, uh, do you think this was, uh, <laughs> did it make the, the budget rise a lot to make uh, sound, post-production and music uh, in Sweden? Especially with uh, attaching Olof Dreyer as a music composer who is a member of the very famous duo The Knife, and uh, maybe another uh, additional question to that, that there is actually not that much of original music in the film in spite of attaching this probably expensive composer. So can you elaborate on that? Yeah, uh, I mean, first of all, we all knew that filming in China with uh, all this expensive camera equipment uh, will cost. So we kind of already thought knew that a big part of, of a possible Swedish, I mean, when we started with possible Swedish uh, production funding would go to the shootings. Uh, so I think the most we spent on the team in China, actually. And regarding the sound post production, I mean, it's not, not more expensive or less expensive than in France or Germany, for example. But yeah, if you compare it perhaps to um to serbia it is but uh i think also that the prices kind of are starting to level up uh, i mean in all um, european countries in a way and um, yeah regarding the music i mean we also really early had talked about that this is not probably a music film that we will would want to work with atmospheres and everything what's really captured um, there. So the deal also with Olaf was that we just want one song from you. Um, as he also has been, you know, turning his, he's uh, becoming a teacher. So he had like, yeah, I can do this on my spare time uh, when he was studying. So we met him many times and we had, I mean, he and Laden had a bunch of meetings but I think we really just wanted to find this one, one thing that uh, we would use for the end titles. Um, and there is, I mean, in the same way we've chosen, I mean, or they've chosen how to shoot the film. I think also that's very planned how we use the sound and music in it. Um, yeah. Okay, and with, um, oh, sorry, do you want to uh, add something to that, Mario, by interrupting? Okay, and uh, Yasmina, France, uh, one of the most expensive countries in Europe to co-produce with. Uh, you already said that it was uh, lengthy, the process to get money, and it was uh, regional funding, so probably there had to be spent 100% or yes, more, actually. 100% of the money has to be spent in our region, but um, we didn't have problem with it because we had like things to do in the region and in the laboratories, and we worked with a very a prominent um, color grader, uh, Isabelle Julien from Ikinokoi Studio, who does, um, like, uh, I don't know, Paul Ferrovin, uh, Tsai Ming Liang uh, films. So I think Mladen was also happy to, to be able to work with her. So she is expensive. I must say that, yes. But as we had uh, money for it, uh, we also thought that it's a good way to approach this type of person and she was interested in the project and she was happy to to work with us so it was um, also it was great so Mladen and um, 
they came to, to, to Paris to grade and uh, we had a great time. <laughs> and it, we were preparing a premiere because we already knew that we were premiering films soon, so it was in a good uh, vibe uh, to, to do this. But we were rooting to get the, the post-production uh, Région Ile-de-France money so that we could do it because we already know some people from Serbia, our colleagues already worked with them and it's just uh, you know a dream to, to just do it there since we did spend a lot of money for to, to have a photography as, as it is in the film so it just made sense to go all the way. Um. I actually, you already mentioned, Eva, that the production and, and Mario, uh, that the production uh, shooting in China is very, very expensive. You had to find a service company to to facilitate that. And you as you didn't have to actually deal with the bureaucracy because of uh, Chinese Sino-Serbian uh, Sino relations that you didn't have to apply for visas from some point. But the shoot was uh, still challenging, expensive, and like uh, you had a long development process, co-development, so money was not in place from some point and there it would just be a straight road. So how did it go in terms of budgeting and planning? I think you had three trips of uh, during which the film was shot, um, or maybe correct me if that's not right, but how was it for you to, and in your group, to discuss what kind of money do we have how long can we still shoot uh, when do we have to stop and like uh, and what with the expenses for chinese uh, services and crew how was that if that was surprising or if it was making it uh, more difficult or can you talk about that yes the prices when we started uh when i started getting the quotes from uh, different Chinese service companies, I was astonished because it was more expensive than any European country. Um, basically, these are the prices. You cannot go around them, uh, and it's just a decision where do you want to do this or not. They also come with a set of different rules which um, are applied to people who are not Chinese and who are working there, which are to mention but a few you know uh, that they have to stay in an, in hotels with with a certain amount of i don't know <laughs> stars <laughs> uh everything is is said to be you know uh pretty um pretty expensive but um what also was very important for us was to work with someone with a with a service company who has enough experience and enough credentials to be able to have this kind of a carte blanche to uh, to do their productions without you know maybe having to 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 have some additional documents or to you know get the, their projects green lighted. So basically, when we started, uh, we were we were lucky to 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 have this kind of a beginning, and once we went for the first test shoot, then the rest. Uh, uh, three times we just you know we made our own contacts and even though we changed the production company for for the one in Shanghai which was very near Yivu and it was by default less expensive um, we we kind of you know felt m more comfortable in in doing all this and uh, because you know shooting in China that that was always a question from you know possible you know co-producers and financiers like uh, so it's a challenge how are you gonna how do you think you can do this and you know how are you gonna surpass all the possible problems but there were none in the end apart from uh, expenses <laughs> but 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 you are right. Uh, um, Midway after the first shoot, we basically found out that we will actually be um, able to uh, to finance the rest of the shoot and that we can actually do it quite um, regularly because the shootings were during 2018. Um, and this is where the Swedish Film Institute uh, well basically made it possible for us because First, we, we, we had the Serbian Film Center with the initial money and uh, and then everything else. Uh, so just to, to sum up this uh, Chinese production, uh, simple question, how many shootings day, how many shooting days did you plan at the beginning? Uh, how much how many was it at the end and uh, what was the total budget? We had the plan was four weeks of shooting. Um, we ended up going there for four weeks in four trenches. 
but the first week ended up being a test shoot because we we did not really use that material. Um, the the overall budget was four hundred and forty thousand euros. And for <laughs> for shoot, uh, well, to be perfectly honest, uh, a bit over fifty thousand for the first, and then uh, a bit over thirty thousand for the rest for per week. Yeah, and we uh, decided early on that we um, would not take any uh, equipment from Serbia, which would be enormously less expensive. But you know, we would be in China with no one to help us if anything goes wrong. Uh, with all the responsibility of you know, uh, it was it was just um, it was a, it was a decision that we would rent it out there, even though it's much more expensive. But we would have support. Uh, um, and unfortunately, we didn't need it. <laughs> it's funny that uh, I would almost have a, a romantic uh, impression of an observational documentary taking place mostly in inside uh, factories where you have just few people. The camera is mostly static, so you would imagine small crew. But you mentioned that there was like fourteen people on set, and that uh, in the editing you had a nightmare of twelve uh, different uh, dialects to deal with which probably also ramped up the prices. So uh, after uh, after the production, this is uh, what you mentioned uh, when we were talking about it before, it was one of the hardest uh, hardest things which um, expanded the, the process of finding the, the final form of the film. Well, this was simply, it's a great thing for a, for a case study because um, to mention that this is something that we, not, we, we did not prepare for. Because uh, we were that uh, we, we we knew that uh, Yivu is a um, is a place where uh, uh, internal migration w within China is um, very. I mean, people from all around around China are going there because the the salaries are very competitive and the work can be pretty uh, rewarding in in every way. Uh, but we did not expect that in the raw footage we would have people from uh, uh, you know places in China where dialects spoken by the people are so different from Mandarin. It's as if they are a completely different language. So we were we had a few. I, mean, I will never <laughs> forget this Jixi dialect, uh, uh, which is <laughs> being spoken in one part of China, and you need to find someone from there to be able to understand what these people are talking about on set we had uh, an interpreter that was you know giving the context and like telling us what what uh, what they are uh, saying but um and every day we would get the transcript but it was not uh, enough to you know edit specific sentences so for that we needed to transcribe and to, to subtitle all the rushes that were interested to us so that was a a, a much longer period than we than we <laughs> wanted and it costed a lot of money but now we know <laughs> so now you know and uh, eventually during the process you you got your you got your um you got your film and with all the pre-sales and uh, also co-productions with broadcasters i think there were three francophone broadcasters uh swiss wiley did you have any kind of um, like feedback or requirements or some like notes from the broadcasters which you would like be obliged to implement or if it was any good maybe all you three can uh, say w what was the process and like uh, finishing delivering the film how what and if it met the expectations of all the different broadcasters well from my side i would mention um the fact that we had uh, three francophone uh, broadcasters that one was uh, broadcasting co-producer, the other pre-sales, but they all uh, initially um, uh, wanted to have the, f the um, exclusivity. So to be the first ones on their territory to show the film, but since Arte is visible in, in their... Uh, so that, that was a challenge and that was something that we actually um, discussed with, with all of our uh, co all of us, and we Together we came to this Solomonic solution to basically put in the contracts something which we called a uh, synchronized Christmas broadcast, so that no one would be the first, but they would, you know, they would they would do it roughly at the same time. And I, uh, I, yeah, I, I have a few photos to basically show this, which we are very proud of, the fact that. Um, 
uh, yeah, that Yivu was was you know shown in in many of Francophone countries for last Christmas at the same time, and this is how our big uh, headache was solved. So we can go to the next one. There's four, I think. Um. So that's uh, NDR Arte and which is a co-producer through your German co-producer and there was also the RTBF RTBF Belgium and broadcaster Swiss. and Swiss and in Germany and Belgium you were obliged to have a national co-producer on board uh, a production company as well which was Visible Films in Belgium and Maya Dev from Germany which brought you into co-production with Heino and for which we were obliged to uh, to finance uh, making of the German version Okay, so that probably took off some of the <laughs> of the uh, pre-sale money, but uh, and it goes back to Eurodoc. Heino was tutor at Eurodoc, so he knew about the project, and he became a co-producer to facilitate the pre-sale to Arte or co-production with Arte, and then he eventually became a sales agent of the film as well, and probably a German distributor. So that kind of brings us to all so far sounded uh, like a great thing to have all these uh, sources already during the production or before production to be able to finance such a challenging uh, production but that probably means that uh, in terms of sales there were already territories which were not available so for the sales agent it would it uh, see it must have been a more challenging job to do so how was it when and at which point did you um, uh, agree with uh, Decker distribution that they would handle the world sales. Well, yes, um, having sold all of these uh, lucrative territories in the production is not a dream of a of a sales agent, but luckily the film is. So, <laughs> so yes, they were uh, very happy about it. But um, we basically started working together with Decker Distribution, which felt natural since Heino was uh, a co-producer. Um, right after we uh, realized, we, we find, found out that uh, Rotterdam will be uh, the place to pr premiere at, at the Bright Future um, selection. Uh, so that was, a, that, was our our, that was our mutual decision. It was, it was very much of a... Uh, we debated because we had different um, um, invitations and uh, we decided that this is the place for this film. Especially since... Mladen intends to also start directing fiction uh, features, so it just, you know, it felt good. Um, so basically after uh, uh, Rotterdam, um, uh, Deckard started to, to do uh, festival distribution and um, we did a round of, of, of a year, it premiered in January 2020. So um, it, it had a good festival run. Uh, we are very happy with uh, with pinpointing festivals that we feel very uh, you know uh, passionate about, um, like Göteborg and Tempo in uh, in Sweden, but also regionally in in our part of the world. Sarajevo Film Festival was was the regional um, premiere, and uh, we also got the the um, the award for the best documentary, Heart of Sarajevo. Um, it was also uh, awarded in Flair Tiana uh, in Russia with uh, with Vipresti Award and a special mention. And and then it did um, um, hot dogs, uh, biography film festival, FIPA doc, uh, and um, and <laughs> what's really strange is that the domestic premiere in Serbia only happened this October, because last year when it was intended to 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 happen, uh, there was COVID. It was impossible. We did not want to uh, premiere in such um, limited or online or limited uh, attendance. It was just, you know, too sad to to show a film that we were working on so hard and so long to to limited audience. So we just premiered, and uh, and in December, around Christmas, around Catholic Christmas, we will start uh, cinema distribution. Well, obviously, it's a strange time to launch a film. It's the beginning of 2020. But uh, Mario, uh, as I think uh, you had already, maybe before the premiere, a Swedish distributor on board. 
and since Sweden is one of the uh, not not sure if the only country which actually didn't have any lockdowns, uh, did it anyhow affect the plan the distribution plans in Sweden? Uh, I mean, of course, we had discussions about how to do it, and it was uh, as with all these politics around the COVID in Sweden, it's been really schizophrenic. Uh, it was, yeah, we didn't really know how to handle it. So we just decided that we go for it. Um, and of course it affected us, um, but it was also the distributor also, I mean, we, they had plans for, you know, the further distribution on platforms, et cetera, et cetera. So for them, it was also really hard to wait another year, which, yeah, maybe we should have done, maybe we shouldn't, I don't know. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that was a clear answer, but yeah, it affected us a lot with COVID. And um, I mean, we also had the, cinema release of skin birds right before it happened so i mean both those titles were really hurt of by uh, the situation um yeah but we have a close down but i mean we still could have some people but uh, that early also in in when it was happening it's like we didn't really know also what this was so yeah well, premier premiering in, in rotterdam in in january just before COVID, at the dawn of COVID. Um, well, it, it made us basically finish the first year of festivals in a, in a, in a longer period than, no, than, than it normally it would take. So at now, at the moment, we are uh, in the second year of festivals and we are basically trying to prolong the life of the, festi of the film as, uh, as much as we can because it deserves it and uh, we are not going to give up. And, uh, and how is it in in France? I, if I'm not mistaken, so far it hasn't been released in France. It hasn't been released because um, actually there was also um, in France it's a bit complicated because uh, programs that are released on TV uh, normally are released on TV and do not uh, then are not released on um, in cinemas. So for the moment, fest the film had festivals in France, but again it was also very much affected by by COVID. So Festivals that didn't take place went online, postponed uh, their editions. So actually, we are taking over a bit now the life of um, of the film itself to, to 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 show it a little bit more than it used to be last year. But uh, I just realized since Arte uh, is on, was on board, didn't it actually wasn't available on French territory? Yes, it was. Yeah, okay, yeah, so yeah that's why. That yeah, on sense. TV. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, but it was broadcasted, but not uh, released mm -hmm. in theaters. But you are not obliged because of the funding to release it. No, 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 no. So uh, we have. Mm, should we show the remaining uh, visual material? Yes, we pictures prepared. from <laughs> premiere. <and laughs> pictures <laughs> from premiere are super fun, and uh, also um, some of the promotional materials that that we did. Um, I mean, we we have done that uh, ourselves um, in cooperation all of the producers um we were in the end we 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 had uh, also a bit of um um well not a bit but support from the post-production funds that kind of made it you know possible to be to be uh taken care of till the production so doha film institute the for doha. example and uh, uh, a, a very nice ending of the of the development, although we were already in production, which was um, an award in Neon by uh, Vision Sud-Est. Um, so this is how we ended our um, financing, uh, and uh, and this is basically the the promotional result. So something that we would like to show: the poster one, two, and um, and tw twelve. We had two versions of the poster, and we never can tell which one is we like more. And there is the video, right? There is a video, yeah. It, it's called 12 Video 2. 
so basically this is one of the four uh, promotional uh, clips that we are using. It's uh, uh, interesting that the characters in the film are very natural, since they are also because of the fact that uh, Mladen on the set maybe didn't always understand immediately what they are saying. So it's pretty nice that you observe them in their very much natural set. And I've read that uh, after the premiere in Rotterdam, there were some Chinese people who saw the film and that they were very moved by, by what they saw. So do you have some uh, feedback also from like Chinese uh, audience and if you have any prospects of actually showing the film in China, which would for sure be interesting uh, market, but I imagine it's not that easy to access it. Well, M M Mario can tell his uh, own um, impressions because uh, we were uh, at Rotterdam together. Um, unfortunately, Yasmina was not because baby number two of our America's Miss production was being born at the moment of the premiere. Um, so that was the biggest test, and and th that was the the for for me that was the most important moment of this production. Uh, was the point where we have shown this uh, this film to to the audience. We were pr we were uh, informed by um, by people of the Rotterdam Film Festival that basically um, Rotterdam is the, the 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 city in the Netherlands with the biggest Chinese um, immigration who are very integrated and um, we can expect to have a lot of Chinese people at the screening, which act, which happened <laughs> on all the screenings we have. We have Chinese people who were um, interested to see. And uh, I was interested to see uh, whether they would, you know, um, whether they would mind anything from the approach, from the tone, from the... You know, you're always very cu very careful when, when you... Uh, when you make a film about other cultures and um, and the feedback was amazing. People were very, very moved and uh, all the questions were about filmmaking and none of them were, you know, uh, imposing that there is something morally or ethically wrong. Uh, before showing it to, to the audience, we also have uh, uh, shown it to Marco Miller who is living in, in um, he is not only the, the famous uh, film programmer, but is living in China for 25 years. So that was the first kind of uh, Chinese uh, uh, proof uh, that the film uh, works. And I think it's exa exactly because of this distance that it's still there. So it's it's close and gentle to, um, to the characters, but um, does not... Um, explain something that you know is would be over the top um i think this is this is overall the overall quality of this film no that's quite quite um uh, it, it's not it doesn't have a, it doesn't try to make a, some strong statement about a global market capitalism meeting uh, in communist country etc so i imagine that can be accessible but you said that mario has some experience with the uh, Chinese uh, audience? Uh, <clears throat> uh, not more than uh, Eva described before. It's just that we were together at the screening. So, yeah. You concur. <laughs>
Okay. Uh, Sorry. Yeah. We have a few minutes left. So um, you mentioned, Eva, that you are working on three new projects of, of Mladen, out of which two are documentaries. Uh, do you plan to continue this uh, this teamwork, this co-development with uh, Yasmina and Mario? Yes, we are talking about it because I think that th that goes for everybody. Once you kind of feel comfortable with working with some people, it's precious and you you are, tend to, <laughs> to to continue. That's, yeah, uh, very, very, very good uh, uh, to gain such experience. But still, I would ask, if there would be something you would do, uh, you would do differently after having this experience of uh, rich, uh, many sources uh, of financing, many countries. Uh, if there is something, maybe you, well, what is the ta uh, takeaway, Yasmina? Uh, like fast, like this. Uh, I must confess, I have not like uh, a conclusion, complete conclusion, because in a way, every project is different but what they are working on now uh, also is um, maybe it's a little bit less um, complicated uh, production wise so what the, the one specific project that we talk about that we might try to uh, or we are trying to find a way how to do it and how to get involved it's much it's much easier so there is not such a big um, and we yeah because we know each other already and we kind of yeah, trust. I don't. I don't know exactly if there is something different to do because we already are a bit different from what we were. I think five years ago or four years ago. So it's already different. Yeah, we are different, and uh, the projects project. are completely different. Well, when you asked questions, I I just thought well, I would just like to uh, be able to do the same, you know, somehow. <laughs> but <laughs> it's not needed. And uh, and to be very specific, now I'm thinking what probably the workflow in the editing room to 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 be ready to to react with all these you know subtitling and this costly and long process and probably since covid hit um uh, i think we should have uh, came on board more proactively about um the the distribution so yeah that these two things could have been done a bit better you mean, for example, like uh, I don't know, taking into taking into account uh, digital distribution as a plan from early on. Digital distribution is something that's um, I think ahead of us. Uh, I was more uh, thinking of um, festivals, but maybe alternative ways of showing it. Since you know, in some countries it was completely impossible. It still is completely impossible, but you know. Um, this kind of hands-on approach on distribution is something that takes a lot of time and, 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 and effort and you need to really dig deep and, 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 and do your homework and it's time consuming and um, uh, but there was a lot of us so um, I think that I would choose that uh, even though when you look at the list of the festivals it's, uh, it's a very cool list. Yeah, definitely. And Mario, for you, uh, do you also expect the same, and do you want to do the same? And uh, you, I hope you, uh, I imagine you expect that the Swedish Film Institute will still be as progressive and on the vanguard of uh, supporting projects from upcome. I mean, from all kinds of places taking in taking place uh, no, the, the, without any uh, expressive Swedish connection, which is this is probably the Swedish connection that it's so so um, eclectic. Yeah, <laughs> um, well, I think most of our projects right now are exactly this, um, just not so Swedish at all, apart from the fact that we are involved in them. And um, with Merry Christmas, I was really afraid that, okay, this is just a one-off, but um, I have the luxury to have the support and from the Swedish Film Institute and they let us do our thing at Sisyphus, which I'm really, really, really happy for. Um, what I would have done different with Mercury, I mean, it's we did our best at that point, and I think uh, none of us had done anything in China before. We, I mean, there are so many things, of course, now knowing 
how it works that we could have been much more efficient in trying to communicate with uh, I mean, all the music rights from China was a hell. It was really a mess, uh, taking back and forth. And yeah, but other than that, no, it's more like <clears throat> it would be great if there could be even more countries thinking in that way. So we, as filmmakers, could focus on making great films instead of trying to find all this how to spend, where to spend, uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, most of our projects are non-Swedish in at heart and in core, and that's what I hope to continue to work with also, so yeah. Hey, thank you, that's a, that's a great thought to, to conclude with, that we should be able to focus on making great films and not, uh, not uh, focusing on where to spend and how, that the point of co-development would be actually to find synergy in the and share vision and build it together, regardless of the country of origin and uh, requirements, etc. So hopefully it will go on like that. I think our time is over, and uh, I would like to thank you all for sharing your experience and uh, having this talk. I think we could go on for a much longer time because there are many, many uh, layers to this, which are equally interesting. But for now, let's uh, let's uh, finish this. So. Thank you again, Yasmina, Iva, Mario. Thank you. And, uh, Thank you for inviting us. Thank you for having us.